Hey guys, what's going on? Jayland Bio here. Today we are going to uh, start our new unit. We are going to be working on um, introduction to equilibrium and equilibrium constant. So, uh, fun thing, we kind of lied to you when we said, uh, you know, all chemical reactions go to completion. And maybe I never actually said that to you. You probably just assumed that because you see your uh, pro uh, reactants, you see your arrow, and then you see products. So you assume that if I mix these two things together, then everything will go to completion. Well, the truth of the matter is, that's actually not the case, and you're going to find out a little bit more about that today. So let's take a look at our learning objectives. For today, you should be able to understand the concept of dynamic equilibrium. You should also be able to determine whether equilibrium lies towards the reactants or products, and then you should also be able to determine equilibrium constant and concentrations today. A few new vocabulary terms for us today. We're going to be talking about dynamic equilibrium, reversible reaction, equilibrium constant, homogeneous reaction, and heterogeneous reactions. So as I mentioned in the introduction to this video, not all reactions actually go to completion. Um, the, most of the ones that we've looked at do, but a lot of them don't. So consider this reaction here. Uh, we've got sulfur dioxide and oxygen that produces sulfur trioxide. Uh, now, for every two moles of sulfur dioxide and one mole of oxygen, you'd expect two moles of SO3. Think about the coefficients of the balanced chemical equation that you see there. But the reality is we only actually get 1.8 moles of product. So that kind of begs the question, why didn't we not get everything? Where's the other 0.2 moles of product that I would expect to get? Well, what this means is that there's still 0.2 moles of SO2 and 0.1 moles of O2. And then the question is, why doesn't it react? And the answer is a little bit complicated. It is reacting, but the reverse reaction is happening simultaneously and at the same rate. And so if I go from my reactants to products, at the same rate I go from my product to my reactant, then I'm not going to see any actual change in the moles. The forward reaction is essentially the same rate as the reverse reaction. So we've actually got all three types of molecules in there simultaneously. Um, that whatever reactants are left over are being converted to product, but the product is also being converted back to reactant. This is known as dynamic equilibrium because even though on both sides you'll have constant concentrations, meaning that the concentrations on each side will not change, there's still a reaction taking place. It's just that the rate of the forward reaction is the same as the rate of the reverse reaction, meaning I'm creating product simultaneously at the same time I'm creating reactant. So that's where the dynamic comes into play. The reaction is still taking place, but we don't see any net change because the forward reaction is going at the same rate as the reverse reaction. So this essentially means that reactions have the ability to be reversed, meaning that a reaction can go from product back to reactant. At dynamic equilibrium, the forward rate is the same as the reverse rate, which makes it appear as though the reaction has stopped. So the concentration, the amount on both sides, will not change at dynamic equilibrium. But the reaction is still taking place because the forward reaction is the same rate as the reverse reaction. So it appears it stopped, but it truly hasn't. Now this is really important here. This does not mean that we have the same amount on both sides. It doesn't mean that we have 50% reactant, 50% product at dynamic equilibrium. Equilibrium can lie very, very far towards the product. Meaning that let's say a reaction would go to 98% completion, very similar to the reaction we looked at at the beginning of this video. There are also reactions where very, very little product is going to be produced, which means that equilibrium lies closer to the reactants, okay? So please keep in mind that even though we're talking about equilibrium, it does not mean equal amounts on both sides. Dynamic equilibrium just means that the forward rate is equal to the reverse rate, and therefore we see no net change in our reactant or product amount. So reaction rates are going to differ as well. Assume we start with just hydrogen and iodine with the reaction that you see on the right-hand side here. Now, initially, the forward reaction will be much faster than the reverse. Well, why would that be the case? Well, we only have reactant. If we only have reactant, then the forward reaction is going to occur because the reverse reaction can't. We don't have any product. As more product is made, though, the forward reaction slows. Kind of makes sense because we have less reactant and more product. And as we get more product, the reverse reaction starts to happen faster as well. Eventually, the forward reaction slows and the reverse reaction speeds up until a point in which they are in dynamic equilibrium. The rate of the forward reaction and the rate of the reverse reaction end up being exactly the same. 
Now do remember that this does not mean we have equal amounts on both sides. It just means that the rate of producing product is the same as the rate of producing reactant, okay? So we can actually calculate these values mathematically, and we look at something that is known as the equilibrium constant. That constant value is labeled K, and you may see it as KC, KEQ, or KP, depending on whether you're looking at pressure, concentration, or just equilibrium. For our sake, we're probably just going to call it KEQ. Um, this is based on a couple different factors. This is based on the concentrations of the reactants and products at equilibrium, as well as the balanced chemical equation. So if you look here on the right-hand side, you have your equation A plus B yields C and D, and this is a reversible reaction. We know this because we have our double-headed arrow. The lowercase a, b, c, and d all represent coefficients of your balanced chemical equation. And so you see here you have a nice little formula that you can plug in here, and that's actually going to give you your value for K. That value for K is very important because that actually tells you if your reaction is going to favor more production of products or more production of your reactants. So we'll take a look at this in just a little more detail. So again, for the reaction that's given there, KEQ is written as follows on the right-hand side here. Essentially, it's the concentration of your products over your concentration of your reactants. And the exponents, little, little a, b, c, and d, are your coefficients of your balanced chemical equation. Okay, so it makes it really easy to write these out. Um, and then we can also plug numbers in and solve for these as well. Let's do a practice problem, just so you see what we're doing. All right, so let's start with something very simple. Let's write the equilibrium expression for this reaction here. Okay, so if we remember to write our equilibrium expression, which is KEQ, it's concentration of my products over concentration of my reactants. Okay, so pretty straightforward there. And remember, we have our exponents here that are given by the coefficients of the equation. So let's just write this expression. And again, it's pretty straightforward to do this. So we get KEQ. EQ uh, equals and our products, so concentration of CS2 over H2, and our reactants go on the bottom. Sorry, writing a little bit differently today. H2S. Okay, pretty straightforward how to do that. Now remember, our exponents are determined by our coefficients. Remember, anything without an exponent is one, so we kind of leave it as is. But H2S, we're gonna square that value, and H2, we're gonna take that to the power of four. That's how you write your equilibrium expression, okay? Pretty straightforward, and then it would be very simple to be able to plug numbers in there and be able to solve. Now, if the numerical value for K is greater than one, what does that tell you? How about less than one? Well, if we think about this, just in terms of mathematics, to get a K value that is greater than one, we would essentially have to have more product over reactant, right? Product would have to be greater than my reactant in order to get a K value that is greater than one, right? So if that's the case, then it is going to favor my products. What if the K value is less than one? Well, if the K value is smaller than one, think about it mathematically, in order to get a number that's smaller than one here, my reactant would have to be a larger number than my product. So in that case, it actually favors reactants. Okay. So again, pretty straightforward there on how to go through and um, write all these out good chunk of your, your assignments are going to be focused on this, all right? Let's move on. So if we're given concentration values, we can easily solve for the value for K. We just write our equation, we plug in the values for our concentration, and we solve. If K is greater than 1, then the reaction favors making more products. You're going to get more products out of that than your reactants. If K is less than 1, then the reaction favors making more reactants. The magnitude of K tells you a lot about the reaction. It tells you uh, by how much it favors reactants or products. So if we have a really, really large value for K, then the reaction essentially goes from completion from reactants to products. If K is very, very small, then we will all have almost no products produced in the reaction. So the magnitude of K, or how large or how small it is, uh, tells you it's more favorable one direction or the other. Ooh, just said one direction. So again, these reactions should be pretty straightforward. Um, at the start of the reaction, we have uh, hydrogen gas plus iodine gas gives you two HI. Cool. The concentrations are uh, H2 is 0.1 molar, 
I is 0.1 molar, and we have no HI. At equilibrium, the concentrations are H2 uh, is 0.158, I is 0 0.021, um, and HI is 0 0.021. Calculate KEQ. Does equilibrium lie to the left or to the right of the equation? Okay, so this is all pretty straightforward here. We're going to take our equation, and we're going to write KEQ for that. Okay, so pretty straightforward. We're going to have KEQ equals, remember that's your concentration of your products. Hi divided by the concentration of your reactants. And don't forget that the uh, coefficients of your equation go as exponents. So there is our equilibrium expression. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, the very first part of this problem has nothing to do with equilibrium. So we really don't deal with these at all. We're just looking at these values right here. And so all we're gonna do is we're just gonna plug those numbers into our expression and solve for KEQ. So uh, we're gonna get HI, so 0 0.021, we're just going to square that, over uh, H.158 times 0 0.021. And then we just plug that into our calculator and solve for K. And so the value we get for that is 0.132. Now there's no, uh, no unit that's associated with K at this point in time, um, or ever. <laughs> And so you have to ask yourself, does equilibrium lie to the left or to the right of the equation? Well, k is less than 1, and so this lies to the left. Okay, pretty straightforward on how to do those types of problems. Let's move on. The last thing I want to talk about today are heterogeneous equilibria, and these are reactions that occur between molecules of different phases, phases meaning like solid, liquid, and gas. Uh, pure liquids and solids are never included in equilibrium expressions, and that's because concentrations of solids and liquids never really change. You know, you can have ice, and then you melt ice, and the ice is still 100% water. So the uh, concentration of that does not change. Same thing with the concentration of a, li a pure liquid. Uh, aqueous solutions, uh, gases, those are things that we include in our equilibrium expression. So if you see a solid or liquid, don't include it in your expression. Okay, one more practice problem, and we are done. Pretty straightforward here. Let's write the equilibrium expression for photosynthesis. Remember that when we look at these, um, no liquids or solids. So we don't need to include that, and we don't need to include that. So now we just write the equilibrium expression just as we normally would. So KEQ equals, remember it is products over reactants. And because there's six, we take them to the power of six, okay? And then if I gave you values for O2 or CO2, you'd be able to plug those in and solve, all right? Pretty straightforward. All right, guys, that's all I have for you today. Make sure you're able to re th reach. Hey, guys, that's all I have for you today. Make sure you're able to meet those learning objectives. I hope you guys have a great day. Um, in the words of Mr. Black, let's make it the best day we can. We'll talk to you later, guys. Bye-bye.